Hello Internet and welcome back to the channel. Here on Financial Journey, we talk all things personal finance, including charting my own family's course towards financial independence. Today I'm going to reveal our investment portfolio, where we stand right now, and talk a little bit about my family's investment strategy and some changes for the coming months. Before I get into that, I do need a quick disclaimer. All of the information here is my own family strategy and for your entertainment only. None of what we are doing should be considered financial advice. Please, I implore you, do your own research or consult with a financial advisor prior to investing any money. But with that out of the way, give this video a like and let's jump right in. In the future, for convenience, I may not limit myself to end of the month reporting, but this month's report is based off data at the end of March. For simplicity's sake, I'll be rounding the values and we'll talk a bit about the individual investments as this is our first video. But let's start with what is currently the bulk of my portfolio, which is my company 401k, currently standing at just shy of $90,000, accounting for just under 65% of my invested funds. Here, these are shaded in various shades of blue. In the US, these accounts are tax advantaged. As a drawback, I cannot access these funds without a penalty prior to age 59 and a half. However, I do also receive a company match to a percentage of the contributions that I make, which is basically just free money. I currently hold about $50,000 in traditional pre-tax funds, which allow for a tax deduction now and then grow tax deferred, but will then be taxed as ordinary income once I take distributions in retirement. The other $40,000 are all in Roth assets, which I pay taxes on prior to the contribution and then grow tax-free. My current strategy is to continue contributing fully into Roth 401k accounts rather than pre-tax. While I cannot guarantee how taxes may change in the coming decades, I can recognize that these are historically low currently and therefore, in my opinion, likely to rise. But even if they don't, I really like the security that knowing that these funds will be tax-free when accessed in retirement, which means that I can easily plan for my retirement income as there are no taxes to consider. Many financial advisors will actually advise having all three buckets of funds in retirement, your pre-tax, your Roth, as well as after-tax normal brokerage funds. And although we are currently contributing fully to Roth in our retirement accounts, we also know that the company match is always a pre-tax investment because my company certainly wants to partake in those tax savings. So while those funds will grow more slowly, we will be building a pool of pre-tax retirement funds as well. But unlike normal brokerage accounts, the investment options are actually quite limited in most 401ks. However, as we're still quite young and intend for our funds to grow for several decades yet, we've actually opted for a pretty aggressive mix of stocks. First, we have large cap stocks, which make up half of this account, and then further subdivided with 30% in a diversified large cap fund, which is kind of similar to the S&P 500, and then 20% in a Russell 3000 fund, which is meant to track the performance of the 3000 largest companies in the US stock market, weighted according to their market capitalization. Another 35% is in small cap funds, which historically have actually performed better than large cap, although they do see a very highly increased volatility with larger increases and drops. This particular fund is the only option that my company offers for small cap, but even here, it's pretty evenly split between small and mid cap stocks, making it slightly less aggressive than some other small cap funds you might be familiar with. And although these funds all have different expenses associated with their management, over the long term in their history, they've really all averaged about 13.5% annually net of fees over 10 year periods. The last 15% here are made up of an international fund which historically has performed considerably worse than the other funds at about a 6% annual rate of return net of fees for 10 year investment periods. But I did move some funds into this uh, in 2020 as a hedge against the pandemic, 
really just not knowing how the U.S. would fare relative to other parts of the world. But as many companies in the S&P 500 do have a significant international footprint, some have actually suggested that even U.S. stock portfolios can provide an implicit hedge internationally. So while there's no way to predict the future of the market, I will likely be moving my position out of this fund in the coming years. Moving on, we have the investments in my after-tax brokerage and IRA accounts. These have much more flexibility and can trade most any security. Again, I'm not gonna specifically advocate for any fund nor claim even that the ones that I'm holding are the best even for the asset class that's they're in. In the orange are various exchange traded funds or ETFs that we hold. ETFs are a collection of stocks designed to provide diversification in a specific sector or index. Our largest holding here at $16,500 is SPY, an ETF which tracks the movement of the S&P 500 index and has averaged a 13.31% annual rate of return over the past 10 years. Although I quite like the makeup of this fund, I will actually be converting these to investments in VOO, which is a near identical fund from Vanguard, which just simply has lower fees. So I'll no longer be investing into SPY and likely shifting some of these funds to VOO in the coming months. Next, we have $6,400 in QQQ, an ETF which tracks the NASDAQ 100 index. Now the NASDAQ 100 is made up of the 100 largest non-financial companies in the NASDAQ composite index and skews heavily towards technology companies with lesser holdings in communication services and consumer cyclicals and then small holdings in other sectors. As my own personal belief is that improvements in technology will continue to define our lives in the coming decades, I have decided to maintain a slight overexposure to this index. The expense ratio here is quite a bit higher than something like SPY or VOO, but there's not really any alternative that I've found to date which presents a better option uh, for this type of exposure. Despite the higher fees though, technology has done phenomenally well and QQQ has averaged nearly 20% annually over the past decade. Next in the small sliver here is an ETF called MTUM, currently sitting at just $1,800 invested. And this is sort of like how a snowball rolling down a mountain picks up speed and grows. This ETF seeks to ride the momentum of large and mid cap companies. And historically, momentum has been a pretty good indicator of performance, as people are really always chasing the next hot thing, with good news begetting good news and all of that. This ETF hasn't been around for a full 10 years, but at five years performed about midway in between SPY and QQQ at a 20% annual rate of return. I'll probably grow this more over time, but overall this ETF hasn't been fully proven in my opinion without the longer history, so it will remain a minority of my portfolio. The final segment of ETFs valued currently at $5,700 are all housed in our Roth IRAs. I've just gone ahead and pooled them here as I don't really intend to continue adding to these investments at this time. When I first began investing in these accounts, I wanted a portfolio with a bit more exposure to healthcare, finance, and so on. But at this point in time, I really just want to simplify my investment strategy and just focus on broad indexes like VOO, QQQ, and MTUM. For completeness though, I'll list the ETFs that I use for the strategy here. But although I currently plan to hold these investments, I ultimately expect that they're gonna be diluted out over time as I continue to build these other parts of my portfolio. The last investments we hold are represented here in purple and are single stocks that I hold positions in. Because of the inherent risk involved in single stock investing, I don't really want to disclose the specific stocks that we're utilizing, but there are a couple sectors with companies that I have specific interest in that we do keep a minor portion of our portfolio invested in. First, we hold some dividend kings, and these are companies who have paid and increased their dividends for at least 50 consecutive years. Although these companies are well established now and may not grow as quickly because of that in the future, historically, investments in these companies outperform the overall market if dividends were reinvested. I don't hold the entire set of 27 here, 
but there are some really great companies in this list. Altogether, my investment in Dividend Kings are currently valued at $4,450 in our portfolio. And the last set of investments we hold are biotech stocks. I do have a personal interest in the field, and so there are a few companies that I follow as they conduct research on investigational products and then plan to bring these treatments to market. Overall, this sector is incredibly volatile. And successful research can frequently cause prices to double or increase by even more. And others can even drop, say, 80% if the studies are ultimately negative. Altogether, our biotech holdings sit at $8,700, largely thanks to significant growth in one of these companies that I had particular familiarity with. And that's currently it for our investments. The last traded section here are $5,200 currently held in cash. Sometimes I'll keep some money in cash like this where I can mess around with options trades, swing trading, or investing in additional single stocks. I recognize that in all likelihood I'll probably lose out on these trades relative to simply just investing in an index fund long term. But I've used these funds in the past to just simply get a better understanding of the workings of the market. That said, I don't really have the time to mess around with that these days, so I'll probably just end up investing these into index funds in April or sometime soon. So with that, thank you all for watching. Altogether, these accounts come to about 30% of my current net worth. However, these are really the bulk of the passive assets that will ultimately determine my retirement nest egg and how much I can withdraw in retirement. So I'm very excited to track the ups and downs the market will bring together with you. Let me know down in the comments how you are investing or if you want more information around ETFs, mutual funds, and the stock market in general. If you've stuck with me this far, please go ahead and leave this video a like and subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. I'm currently posting twice a week on personal finance, investing, and retirement not to mention tracking my own family's finances as we strive for financial independence. So check back soon and I'll see you in the next one.